just in the past five or 10 years. We call these the second machine age technologies, comparing them to the first machine age when we automated muscle work with the steam engine and the internal combustion engine uh, one and two centuries ago. Today, we are beginning to automate cognitive tasks, the brain um, and the mind. Routine information processing, things like clerical work, uh, travel agents, bookkeepers, accountants, managers, secretaries, these account for about 60% of workers in advanced countries in Europe, Japan, and the United States. And they are in the bullseye of the automation using computers and software. The technologies have advanced very rapidly over the past decade, and they will advance even more in the next 10 years. And as a result, many of the kinds of jobs that people used to do in those categories are no longer needed because machines can do them. We've seen a big drop in any job that involves routine information processing. And I expect to see an even bigger drop going forward. This is gonna require a whole new set of skills and some major adjustments. So with the development of IT, you have mentioned even factories with automation, the workers cannot get their job, but also the white color workers' employment is also threatened. That is a very shocking situation. Mr. Ian Grandi, from the position of the human resources business, what do you think of this problem between development of IT and the job of the youth? Well, I think it's something that's been happening for decades now. I mean, you've only got to look at the, the automotive business to see how 20, 30 years ago, automation robots started to, to replace some employees. So I think it, it becomes more of an important issue as recognizing it's going to continue, which it is. How do we retake, retrain and reskill those individuals that may be working in businesses that are going to be overtaken by technology? And then from an academic perspective, how are people trained initially in completely different areas. But I do think that long term there's an upside as well and that we are going to start to see more technology, more digital startups, you're going to see more entrepreneurial initiatives. And as technology becomes more prominent and people start to work in a more entrepreneurial and individual way, there will hopefully be long term some upside from this as well. え、それではイタリアのファッチョさんは positive or negative of the balance uh, between job creation or job destruction connected to ICT is hard to say, especially in countries where ICT um, does not um, count for a big share of the economy, as in Italy. So increasing ICT uh, would also mean increasing productivity, and this would I mean increasing the size of the economic uh, of, of the pie of the economy. So in this sense, um, it is hard to say if it uh, would imply uh, a negative effect for young people in Italy. I think that connected to the ICT um, economic economy, uh, there is the job polarization. So medium average skill uh, will will be less and less requested by the market, but especially high. A uh, skilled individual will be uh, asked and requested by employers. I, th I think this is one of the main consequences. Well, Dr. Kilgard, as Dr. Fazio was saying, with development of ITs, the labor market is bipolarizing, and if that is the case with polarization, if sufficient youth can be employed in general, the situation might be different, but what do you think about the polarization of the labor market? 
Well, I think it is an unfortunate uh, fact of life for precisely the reasons that Professor Brynjolfsson uh, laid out, namely that we are entering an era where technology will uh, replace and in fact make redundant a large number of jobs in the traditional job creation, ser creating services sectors. Uh, so we are left with uh, you know, basically two types of jobs in a so-called hourglass economy. It is those jobs that are very high skilled, basically people that have the skills to leverage and utilize technology uh, in a way to uh, make them reach uh, more parts of the world, more customers, etc. And then it is those at the very bottom which have jobs that basically cannot be automated, even with IT. That will be uh, low-skilled uh, workers in restaurants, in security uh, services, elderly care, and those types of issues. Uh, so if we want to avoid this kind of an hourglass labor market translating into very dramatic income inequality uh, in all advanced co economies in the future, uh, this is a major, major educational challenge uh, for all advanced economies. Well, it seems that Professor Bilnyovson is raising his hand. So as Dr. Kilgard was saying, income may be polarized, and with that, is it possible to secure the total necessary number of employment? Yes, um, I agree with, with my, my colleagues that the new technologies are polarizing the labor market. It's the middle skilled jobs, the ones that involve routine information processing that have been affected the most in terms of automation. But at the same time, we've had increased demand at the high end. And also uh, at the low end, people have been relatively immune. People doing uh, tasks like uh, hairdressing, cooking, gardening, janitor, those have not been very affected by technology. But the middle skill jobs, not just in the ICT sector, but in the entire information work and knowledge work or white collar work sector, those are the ones that have been affected the most and those will be affected more. Now I want to stress, if we handle this correctly, it should be good news for the economy because it does generate more wealth, more productivity overall. But it also leads to a very violent restructuring of the kind of demand. More demand at these ends and less demand in the middle. So that can lead to a lot of unemployment for some people, even as incomes and wages rise for other people. Mr. Sim, what do you think of what was mentioned by Professor Bilnyovson? Do you have any comments? I think, uh, yes, uh, technological upgrades in the industry may reduce jobs, but I will only say this with certain qualification, and I think uh, Professor Brian Johnson will agree. Uh, firstly, when a company innovates with technology, a certain types of job may be dispensed with uh, what Professor called routine information processing jobs. These are usually very labor-intensive, low productivity, and often low-wage jobs. Secondly, when technology is introduced, the market, and in many cases, together with government intervention, will drive capacity building uh, among workers, especially among young people. Consequently, such move not only promotes uh, skills upgrade, but also creates higher-value jobs for the young workers. And finally, we must not forget that there will be spillover effect. The utilization of technology creates its very own secondary and supporting industry, which in turn means more new jobs as well. Yes, we may lose a certain types of jobs, but we also create other jobs, especially higher productivity, higher value ones. I think the government's role is to encourage innovation because innovation and technology are supposed to up the value chain to generate wealth and therefore improve the profitability of a business. But such policy must be complemented with incentive for employers, especially small and medium enterprises, SMEs, to retain and retrain their workers, especially young workers. Well, Professor Yamada, so we're discussing about the influence of developments of IT. In Japan, 
Is the situation the same? Yes, I think it is most prominent in Japan. Japan so far, in the factories and the white color workers, in, in the middle range workers, uh, works with higher skill was occupying a large proportion. But as I mentioned, with automation and IT, the number of such jobs will decline and works that cannot be done by machines. You may think these are creative works, but also in the service sector, and there must be someone to transport goods if you, if you sell through the internet. If you, the factories make cakes, there must be a person to uh, clean the strawberries for the cakes. So simple work is necessary. People who do manual work is necessary. In you know, Western nations, most of such works were covered by the immigrants. But in Japan, we don't have immigrants. And because of that, the youth are affected. So unemployment is not so high. But low wage that they cannot become independent is spread out among the younger generation. So because of that, as Mr. Sim was saying, in some way or another, there must be policy measures implemented. Yes, it is necessary. But can that person stay in that position forever? That is the question. So as you have seen, the youth in the developed nations are suffering of unemployment, but there is a developed nation with relatively low unemployment, which is Austria. This graph shows the youth unemployment in the developed nations compared with that of Austria. At the Lehman shock in 2008, unemployment is increasing in the developed nations, but it is being maintained at a level below 10% in Austria. Austria is taking a thorough approach to promote employment among the youth. Austria receives 25 million tourists every year. Tourism is a key industry supporting the nation. There are 28 vocational education schools to develop human resources for the tourism industry. One of them is Module Tourism Vocational Education School in Vienna. About 600 students are studying to acquire qualifications to work in hotels, restaurants, and travel agents. This is an integrated education from the age of 14 to 18 for five years. Not only general education, but they receive comprehensive education to study on site by studying specialized knowledge in the tourism industry. This day, they are learning about how to serve customers and how to make traditional Austrian sweets. In this way, they study about their own culture and history necessary in the tourism industry. I am interested in managing hotels or restaurants. In the future, I want to start my own business. To study from early days, on the job I wish, I had no doubts about going into this career. The youth in Austria can choose from three career paths from the age of 14. One course is for five years until the age of 18. They receive vocational education and general education and get job qualification and qualification to go to university at the same time. Another course is for the maximum of three years, vocational training and get unemployment. And the other course is general education and aim at entering a university. Out of those, the number of students receiving vocational education and the vocational training is about 75%. The students who chose to work 
will go to vocational education schools appropriate for this country's industrial structure and get qualifications required for their jobs. In Austria, there is a system to develop human resources that will con contribute to the country's industry by acquiring advanced qualifications and high will to work. It is good to learn about a job from early stages. In Austria, there is another employment measure for the youth. Up to the age of 21, there is a policy called Youth Guarantee, providing employment opportunities for the youth. The Labor Bureau in Vienna, youth who want to change their career path or who got employed once but decided to quit because they found the job not to suit, suit them come for consultation. By using the Youth Guarantee, they can choose their path within three months of vocational training or training in companies or be employed or continue to go to school. Those who cannot decide their career path can acquire the qualifications like a car mechanics or carpenters through the vocational training program. There is also a safety net provided. All youth must be given the opportunity to work. This is why we established the Youth Guarantee. Going forward, all young people must have opportunities to get a job and be able to plan their lives with hopes towards the future. We want to continue to support them to do so. So, Mr. Grandi, from the company's perspective, are graduates of vocational schools attractive? What do you think? Yes, I think that what Austria is doing is very forward-thinking, this, this approach towards dual education. And I think if we look at what the role of schools and academic institutions is, it's, it's not to prepare people for exams, it is to prepare them for the world of work. And the earlier that somebody can start to become familiar with the types of industries and careers, the better. I think with the, there's, there's a number of different options. There's apprenticeships, there's scholarships, there's intern programs. Uh, they need to be governed well. It needs to be sure that these are the right types of opportunities for people to be exploring. So I think it's a very good idea. I also believe that it allows for employers to be able to be identifying individuals that they may want to come and work for them once they finish their studies. So I think it can work for both parties, both the job seeker and also for the employer as well. それではイタリアのファッチョさんは徹底した教育、まあ職業教育やユースギャランティー制度ですね。これはイタリアの若者にとっても効果があると思いますか。The um, youth guarantee um, in Europe uh, is a new uh, approach of tackling youth unemployment and uh, it basically uh, aims at giving to everyone within four months uh, after the leaving of education or entering unemployment a good uh, opportunity uh, in work such as uh, apprenticeship, traineeship uh, or continued uh, education. So there is uh, no uh, assessment of the overall effectiveness of this measure since uh, um, it, it has been endorsed by EU countries in April 2013 with the Council recommendation. However, there are uh, best practices such as uh, Austria, as outlined in the, in the video, or also Finland, who uh, undertake uh, a, co a comprehensive uh, strategy with youth guarantee and 83.5% of young people in Finland uh, received actually a job offer or training offer within three months from uh, leaving education or entering an unemployment. Uh, the, the estimated cost of this measure is uh, 21 billion euro uh, overall in Europe, but uh, this is um, uh, much lower than the cost of inactivity, which is estimated to be over 150 
50 um, billion euro for the cost of young people uh, not working and neither um, being involved in any educational program. Cost-wise, you are saying that this is viable. On the other hand, Dr. Kierkegaard had a question. As we have been discussing, the industrial structure is going through very rapid changes, and that may be one of the reasons of youth unemployment. So, vocational training takes a certain period of time, but can the vocational training respond to the changes in the industrial structure? Uh, yes, absolutely. I don't think that, in fact, I think vocational training is, in fact, far superior to uh, responding to changes in the industrial structure than, say, an academic university setting. Because as we saw in the video from Austria, if vocational training is done well and well designed, it actually is kind of a partnership between the publicly funded educational institution and private businesses so that there is a very direct feedback link between the needs of industry uh, uh, and businesses and the kind of skills that vocational training uh, can provide. And I think it's also worth uh, understanding that vocational training uh, is actually a way to ensure that even though people that have jobs that, for instance, here in the United States are typically regarded as low skilled, such as a waiter uh, in a restaurant, is actually in some ways a skilled worker in Austria because you go to uh, school for a number of years to learn the trait uh, uh, of, a, uh, uh, of a waiter, which again uh, should serve uh, to provide you with some degree of employment and income security uh, going forward. But as I said, I think vocational training can certainly be uh, very responsive to the changing uh, needs of industry. So, after you learn for many years, you have to continue to do that. So, Mr. Sim, Professor K Dr. Kilgar said that vocational training is better than university education. So, Mr. Sim, what do you think about policies about the employment of the youth? I think, I think it's very important that our education system should at least simulate real-world situation. The feeling many people have when they graduate and enter the job market is they will be trained for a world that does not exist. What they learn in school seems so irrelevant to the real world. And the German apprenticeship or, or even the Austrian apprenticeship model, the vocational model, has been hailed as a very good uh, school-to-work transition program. But on the other hand, apprenticeship can also have its constraint. Uh, for example, skill learned uh, in in a vocational setting or in an apprenticeship setting can be very limited and tied to, say, the specific conditions of the company which the student uh, trained in. So a good vocational training must have an up-to-date curriculum with healthy interaction with the world, not just with the private sector, but also civil society at large. Don't Basically, the bottom line is don't train our young people for a world that does not exist. I have a question to you, Professor Yamada. Mr. Sim was saying that there is a history in Europe as an assumption, but on the other hand, when we look at the tweets, the vocational training of Austria is very active but, and positive, and vocational training in Japan seems to be passive. So vocational education for the youth what do you think of this method? The European method is a good method, but Japan tends to hire only the new grads. That is the problem in Japan. If you become a regular employee, the companies provide all types of job training for the regular employees.